My name is Greg Meyer. I teach in the engineering department, as um, you mentioned. Most of you who know me know me as a guy who likes to make stuff, which is true. I've been doing it for a very, very long time, since I could probably even walk. Um, what you may not know is that I really, really love math, not always for solving engineering problems, just math for math's sake. Some of you do math for, uh, or do crossword puzzles. I can sit and play with a calculus problem just for fun. But what really interests me is this intersection of math and making stuff. Because making stuff by itself, you may use a little bit of math, tape measure math kind of thing, um, but the intersection of being able to actually take theory and crunch the numbers, sometimes pretty complicated equations, and build something that's an experiment that goes through and proves those ex um, experiments in the theory, that's what I think is really cool. And it's a little bit kind of like this praxis idea where you've got theory and you put it into practice and you actually demonstrate. I also feel it's a very powerful way to actually engage students. Um, it's been so fun that I've been kind of collecting over the uh, past few years a group of these little demonstrations I call math busters. Um, and this is where we go through and we take an idea. And I'm always on the lookout for a new math buster. Uh, take, for example, um, oh, in my class I usually like to do kind of silly things because they're a wild group of kids. How fast would you have to be going? to clear the Morrison Bridge as the gates are go or the bridge is going up. <laughs> so we actually, we get out our little scale and we, and we can measure things and we know what the angle is and it turns out, how fast do you think you have to go? Yeah, it's really, it's like 30 miles an hour. It's not very fast. <laughs> um, and we could, yeah. And you don't want to go too fast either, right? Because the landing on the other side isn't that good. So we would take a problem like this, a hypothetical problem, crunch the numbers, and then we would go back and try to emulate that with some kind of a small scale experiment in class. So maybe we're using little uh, Angry Birds Hot Wheel cars and a Hot Wheel track. It, you know, that's a typical scenario. Uh, another one, maybe a little more gruesome. Say you're uh, enjoying uh, your happy hour on the 30th floor of Big Pink and a fire breaks out. All of the elevators quit working, all of the stairs are all plugged up. Nobody's gonna make it out, but you, the engineer, you go back and say, gee, I don't wanna jump out the window with nothing you know, to, to save me. How many white tablecloths can you commandeer <laughs> and tie them together to make yourself a parachute that is at least survivable. It's a real math problem, okay? And we can go through and we follow that up and we have them you know, grab a paper bag or a plastic bag and cut it up and build a parachute and actually run the numbers. Uh, so what I wanted to do for this specific uh, example today was episode one of Math Busters and that is build a boat. And so imagine this, it's kind of a playoff on my Build-A-Bot series, by the way. Um, say you're a group of kids and uh, you live next to a pond and there's this island out in the pond and it's got pirate booty on it. You're just sure of it. How are you going to get out to it? Well, you're going to have to buy your, or build yourself some kind of a boat, right? So let's go through this exercise and figure out how to actually build a boat. So by the way, the whole magic part of this really isn't to do with the examples themselves. It's when the light bulb goes on when the students actually crunch those numbers and they do the experiment and it's like, wow, we're actually like right on the money. That's the magic is looking at the experience and the look of kind of excitement and surprise in their face. So here we go, here's our island and we know that there's buried treasure on there. Uh, have to ask ourselves a few questions. Uh, where are we gonna get the wood? Assuming we're gonna make it out of wood because we're kids and that's probably the easiest thing. So we go around and we're kind of looking. We see a piece of plywood nearby. It's like, cool. That looks like a perfect boat if you ask me. The only problem is it's the neighbor's uh, ramp. <laughs> but they gotta go in for dinner sooner or later, right? So. <laughs> So now that we've taken care of that problem, the next question we might have is, how do we actually cut that up to optimize our boat? 
So we've got a couple of examples or a couple of options here. Maybe. Um, we can either cut it up such that it's a square boat with a square bottom, here we go, and simple sides, or we can do maybe a rectangular uh, boat. We have to weigh things off, like is it easier to actually, a rectangular boat might be easier to paddle, for example, than a square boat. But it's also a little more difficult for a kid to build, and it doesn't hold as much for our, for our uh, pirate booty. So we're gonna pick this guy right here. The next question that we might have is, how are we actually going to, there it is, figure out how many kids to get to go over to the island? We've got our piece of plywood, we've got our little build plan, it's gonna have a four by four base, it's gonna have one foot tall sides, and it's gonna have a total of 16 cubic feet of water displacement capability. So to answer that question, we go into our fluid mechanics book. Chapter five is all about buoyancy. Who's this guy? Well, it's kind of cheating there. Archimedes. <laughs> How long ago did Archimedes live? 200 years ago? 500 years ago? Yeah, close. Yeah, so over 2,000 years ago for sure. And this is just like one of dozens of just really incredible discoveries that this guy made. And Archimedes' buoyancy principle is very simple. It goes like this. If you've got some kind of a boat, which is what where our objective is, and you put it in water, the lifting force or the buoyancy force is simply equal to the weight of the water that it displaces. So the equation for it right down here, V sub D is just the volume of the displaced fluid, rho, that is the density of water, and G is the acceleration due to gravity. Now it turns out if you combine these two terms right here, rho times gravity, it's known as the specific weight of a substance. And in this case, it's how much does it weigh per a given volume. Water, which is what we're uh, trying to do right here, weighs 62.4 pounds for a cubic foot of water. So if you've got a bucket of water that's a foot square, it's gonna weigh 62.4 pounds. So now let's go through and take a look at doing a little bit of math. What do we have as far as our data? We wanna figure out what our lifting capacity is. So our buoyancy force, Ah, this is just like being in AM112 trying to find a pen that works. <laughs> it's equal to the volume of the displaced fluid times, I'm going to invent a new symbol there, that's the specific weight of water that we just talked about. So now our buoyancy force for the boat that we're making here is equal to what was our volume of displaced fluid? S 16 cubic feet and the weight of water per cubic foot is 62.4 pounds for every one cubic foot. And we multiply those two together, canceling out our units, and we get very suspiciously close to 1,000 pounds. That's just purely accidental. <laughs> About 1,000 pounds. Now, is that what it, how much it can actually lift? or carry. We're missing one little part of this. The weight of the boat, but the weight of the boat in this case is only 25 pounds, but we'll factor that in anyway. So our cargo capacity is the buoyancy force minus the weight of our boat. So that's still about 975 pounds. And I'm just stating an assumption up here, kids weigh about 100 pounds a piece. So that is nine kids that our boat can actually carry. Nine very, very, very still kids, yeah. right? On a very, very, very calm day and paddling very, very, very slowly. But nevertheless, the theoretical capability of that boat is close to 1,000 pounds. Now, if I were you, I would say, God, that doesn't seem quite right. I mean, that's just a little piece of wood, right? That's, oh, that's half of a, a car. It's more than half of my car. In fact, I drive a smart car. It's probably more than my smart car. Um, so let's go ahead and try to put this theory to the test. 
And I thought, well, maybe we can go ahead and build ourselves a little prototype model. So I went on to my CAD station. I designed our boat that looks a lot like the wooden boat, and I timed it. From the time I actually clicked my first mouse button to the time I was finished was 46 seconds. So it's not a very big process. Of course, it is a pretty simple looking boat, too. Uh, now, I've got a boat. Now, what am I going to do with it? I want to actually test the boat. So I'm going to go ahead and use the, one of our 3D printers in the makerspace. And I've got a little video clip here showing the boat right here being printed out. Just goes back and forth. And I think the print job maybe took uh, about two hours. And I've got one, another one that I'll go ahead and just pass around. This is what it looks like when it comes right off of the machine. You have to peel away a little bit of extra plastic. Okay, so I've got my little boat. Now I want to figure out how much should my little boat carry? Well, I was pretty tricky with this prototype, and I did a scale model. And if you do a scale model, then you could take the numbers that you had and actually just multiply it by a scaling factor. So in our scale, we had one cubic foot of water, and we said that weighed 62.4 pounds. How much does it, if we're doing one foot to one inch on our scale, and if you divide that up 12 ways that way, 12 ways that way, 12 that way, so on and so forth. Anybody have that number in your head? How many of these little cubic inches are in one cubic foot? 17, 20, oh, that's pretty good. Oh, you, so one foot cubed equals 17, 28, inches cubed. So how much should our little boat carry then? If our big boat carried about a thousand pounds, we're going to factor in the weight of the boat later. So the buoyancy force of our little prototype boat is going to equal the 1,000 pounds. And we're going to divide that by our scaling factor of 1728. And that comes out to, I think, uh, 0.579, maybe. Yeah, 0.579 pounds. So a little more than half a pound of lifting force out of our little plastic box that we have here. But that doesn't really answer our question or prove anything. We want to figure out, does it actually carry the booty out of, off of our island? So we want to be able to convert this weight to something that we can actually measure, and we're going to use a bunch of quarters here to actually play through it. So our boat buoyancy is 0.57 pounds. The cargo, just like in before, was our buoyancy force minus the weight of our boat. And in this case, I put our little boat on the scale in our engineering lab, and that came out to point four, six, nine pounds. So it started out 0.579. Our boat weighed just over a tenth of a pound. Still, we're not quite where we want to be yet. We want to figure out how many quarters fit in here. So, kids. pardon me? What happens if little kids? We're not going to put them in the boat? No. Well, yeah, they can try. <laughs> they can sit on the little boat and pretend in the bathtub. So we want to find out how many quarters fit in our little boat. Well, it turns out that there are 80 quarters per pound, one pound. So if there's 80 quarters and one pound, we ought to be able to fit 80 times 0.469, and that comes out to 0.37 and a half quarters. That's our target. So this is what our little experiment is going to be all about. So I need, uh, let's see, somebody with steady hands. <laughs> I pay him, so he better have steady hands. And we're going to count out. And um, I would suggest when you do a little experiment like this that you have to set it up pretty carefully because your boat's not going to 
carry very much, just like your kid boats, if they're all on one side. So I would say that maybe we need, uh, we're shooting for 37 quarters. And all of these experiments, if you get within 20 or 10 percent of what you're shooting for, I call that a win. So if we can get between 35 and 40, let's, let's call it good. Count out 30. Yeah, you go ahead and cut. I'll let him cut. 26, 25, 40, 60. I shouldn't be sabotaging my own experiment. I'll make, I'll help you out here. There's five. 20? Yeah, put 25 in there. This is Eric Thompson, by the way. Don't drop any. One quarter can make all the difference in the world. Okay, is that it? Okay, we're going to try and float our boat here. Yes. Just put the boat in here. Oh, turn it on the projector. That is 30? 25. 25. Here's another five. 25. Ooh, we need to put some on this side. Here's uh, so are we at uh, 30 now or 35? About 30. We're at 30? Yeah. Here's another five. Oh, four. Four? Maybe back over here. It's 35. 36. 37. 36. And one more for 37. Is this th going for 37? It's 36. It's 36. One more. There goes my lunch money. <laughs> so if we had a half quarter, it ought to just barely hold it, right? Yeah, do you have one? <laughs> yeah, I got a half quarter in my pocket. Isn't oh, it? Really? Yeah. Here. Oh. So if you looked at this really carefully, what you're going to see due to the, the meniscus of this, we're actually carrying a little bit more than what our rated capacity is. And we're, the, the boat is sitting down below the surface a little bit. So what I'd like to do is add one more little bit of learning here. I'm not going to put it, I'm not going to grease the, uh, the quarters themselves. But let's just see if it's enough. Ooh, close, close. Maybe let's put the other half of a quarter in there. Oh, we were, got a good day here. Another one? We're at 37 and a half. There we go. So we were like on the money. Um, so just very briefly, and I'll wrap it up, a couple of places where we would use this out there as far as students and learning. You look at the river barges going by every day, right? Um, so there's a typical river barge. How many of you have seen the, uh, the uh, barge? Did you know that we made barges in Portland? How many of you knew we made barges in Portland? It's awesome. About every uh, three or four months, they actually do a barge launch, complete with bagpipes and everything, and it's just really awesome. Here we go. And they slide it in sideways. And then lastly, you know, you might find them with high-tech uh, buoys that are generating electricity, or even something like a giant blimp. All the forces, whether it's uh, liquid or in air, they're both fluid. So they're both applicable and both applicable into the greater Portland area. So I really like this experiment because it's, there's some tension involved and there's some local applicability to it. Uh, and it's pretty easy to actually build. So that's it. Thank you. And if you want to try and duplicate this at home, you know, get a cat food can or something like that. and paint. You don't have to have a 3D printer. It works, works every bit as well. Okay. Yes, sir. So how's the, the maker space being available? How's that changed in the other classroom? It just, it, it really kind of spawns 
um, the, the doing aspect rather than just hypothesizing. It makes it really easy to just go in there and actually crank out a prototype. It's made a huge difference. Can you maybe tell people about it, how they can participate? Sure, we've got uh, our maker spaces all the way at the very end of this corridor. Uh, you find yourself down at the very end and on the left hand side in HP 202, we've got 3D printers, uh, brand new laser cutters, some CNC routers, and the hours of operation are actually posted on the door as far as availability. And we've got a number of classes, one unit classes that you can sign up for. And the important thing to note about those classes is they're all self-paced. Um, you don't have to sign up at the beginning of the term and at the end of the term. So it's typically an hour or two of instruction, and then we just turn you loose on your own personal project. And those are done in conjunction with Dan Finley and the machine shop. So I'll give Dan credit for actually making all of the makerspace happen, as well as Diederich, because those are the guys that actually kind of prompted me on, and this gentleman right here helped with the funding of it. And Brigitte, you can come down and play before you... And, and we've got some business. And Dr. Brown, Dr. Jeremy Brown, what would you like to make today? <laughs> Trouble. Oh, wait, did that come out of my mouth? <laughs> all right. All right. Thanks all for coming.